Okay, here we are. Mark chapter 1. We're going to be looking at God's call to service. We'll be seeing that in the second portion of our study, but we'll begin with verses 14 and 15. And uh, I'll give you, as I've done, some introductory comments as I like to develop a foundation and context, and then we'll move into our study. Uh, so reading at verse 14, 14 and 15, Mark chapter 1. Mark writes, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so as I mentioned, I'm going to give you a little context, develop a foundation and move into our study. And so here we are in the first chapter of the gospel of Mark. And as we've seen by going through the first several verses Mark's style is not filled with details, as you find in, in other Gospels. His writing style is intended to condense various events into a few verses. We saw this when he introduced John the Baptist. And, and as you'll notice, as we looked at John the Baptist, he actually avoided details uh, about his birth and, and various things that are actually communicated to us in other Gospels. We know that Luke, in other words, de uh, dedicated much of chapter 1 to the life of John and and in his gospel, and Matthew and John gave more information concerning John the Baptist. But on the other hand, when we looked at Mark's account of John the Baptist, well, Mark's account was brief. He gave enough information to be acquainted with John, but he didn't give a lot of detail. He did the same thing when he introduced Jesus to his, uh, to his readers. He wrote of Jesus' baptism. He spoke of his anointing. And in two verses, he handled the temptation of Christ. So it seems obvious that, that Mark intended to give brief snapshots to his readers, and, and that would fit into his goal to present Jesus as being on the go, that Jesus is busy all the time. That scene, as I mentioned to you, that's seen by his use of the word immediately, which he uses quite often. In verse 10, it says, immediately Jesus came out of the water of baptism. In verse 12, immediately the Spirit drove Jesus to the wilderness. In verse 18, immediately Simon and Andrew left their nets and followed Jesus. In verses 19, 20, 21, 28, and verse 42, the translators chose to use the word immediately. In verses 29, 30, and 43, the word immediately is replaced with as soon or at once. And so he wanted to show Jesus on the move. And that's what we see here. So after speaking of Jesus' temptation, he now introduces us to his teaching ministry. And the events that we're looking at, for those who take notes, are actually occurring between six months to a year later than what he had just reported. To fill it in a little bit, Jesus had been in the south in an area called Judea. But Mark bypassed that. You see that ministry in John's gospel. You see it in John chapter 2 verse 13, all the way to chapter 4, verse 3. And that records what Jesus did, including the cleansing of the temple. In John chapter 4, well, that records his ministry to the woman of Samaria. But, but Mark ignores that. You see, Mark was led by the Spirit to focus on the beginning of Jesus' preaching ministry. And so he begins after John had been jailed for telling King Herod that he was in sin. When you read concerning that, and we'll be looking at that in detail in later chapter, but when you look concerning what had happened, Herod, who was the king at that time, had, had taken his brother Philip's wife. Her name was Herodias and, and uh, was living in adultery, and that resulted in, in John being jailed. You see, John preached that it wasn't permissible for Herod to be married to this woman, and there are basically two reasons why it was wrong. Well, the first one is that Herod stole Herodias from his brother Philip while on a visit to Rome. And Philip was half-brother to Herod, having the same father but different mothers. And that provoked John the Baptist to openly confront his sin. We see it in Mark, uh, rather Matthew 14, verses 3 and 4, where it says, Herod had laid hold of John and bound him, put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Now, Matthew referred to Herodias in a way that you might want to note. Matthew referred to Herodias as, as his brother Philip's wife. The Holy Spirit, in other words, did not allow Matthew to call Herodias his wife. And this is because he was living in adultery. You see, to marry her, he had to divorce his present wife 
and by marrying her, he committed adultery. In Mark chapter 10, we'll see this in verses 11 and 12. He says to them, whoever shall put away his wife and marry another commits adultery against her. If a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she commits adultery. What he had done, he was presently married, divorced on purpose to marry somebody else's wife, and thus that's a sin of adultery. But also Herodias, this is even, even makes it even worse. Herodias was the daughter of both Herod and Philip's half-brother Aristobulus. That made Herodias his niece, and by marrying her, he was guilty of another sin called incest. In Leviticus 18, 6, it says, No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I'm the Lord. And so when John confronted Herod, and we're going to see this in detail when we get to the chapter that deals with this, but when John confronted him, Herod put him into prison. Having his sin openly rebuked infuriated him. The conviction was immense. He was so angry with John that he wanted to execute him, but at first he wouldn't. Matthew 14, 5 says, although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. And so these are the small details that led up to the uh, imprisonment and the simple statement here, John was put in prison. When we get to, uh, to uh, Mark chapter 6, we're going to look at that in more detail. But that's why John was put in prison. And so it says again, after John, verse 14, was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, both Jesus and John had been ministering in the south, and it was called Judah. But Jesus now is going to the north. The southern Jews considered northern Jews as unsophisticated. The fact was Jesus' ministry in the north was a comment. It was a comment on the on what would be called the spiritual apostasy in the south. Jerusalem was the center, but it was filled with religious corruption. The corruption was so deep that it even affected the temple. The Galilee, which is in the north, was actually more populated than the south. And because there was a, a, a way, it's called the way of the sea, a via maris, uh, coming from the Mediterranean and going up into Damascus, because of this road, the Via Maris, there were many travelers who had crossed through the Galilee region. And so because it was like a highway, there were a lot of people for Jesus to minister to. And so Jesus goes to the north and he's beginning to minister. And notice how it says in verse 14, he came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So Mark had told us that when Jesus was baptized, he had been anointed by the Holy Spirit and the Spirit had driven him into the wilderness and that's where he had resisted the temptations of Satan. So after resisting Satan, he began his ministry and now he returns to the north. In Luke 4, 14 and 15, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. So he comes to Galilee, and he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He's moving from town to town, village to village, and he's preaching the message of salvation. He's preaching what is called the kingdom of God. Now, preaching the gospel, this is important, and I want to develop this with you for a moment. All of this is obviously, it's scripture, but this is an important point. Preaching the gospel is part of God's way of bringing salvation to people. When Mark began his book, he spoke of the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and I mentioned to you that in chapter 1, verse 1, that this was referring to what is called the written gospel. But here, Mark is referring to the spoken gospel. The spoken gospel has been called the message of salvation. The gospel. The gospel is speaking the truth of God, especially as it concerns sin and judgment. And Jesus, as he's preaching the gospel, is making it clear concerning how you can enter in to heaven. And so he tells us in verse 15, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so the gospel message speaks to the core of our problems in life. It's a message that says that sin has destroyed us. 
and man needs to turn from it. We're living in a very confused era, and I'll share a few things with you about this right now. We're living in a very confused time. We think that if we pass laws or do certain things, that life is going to become better. But the gospel message is the only message that reaches the heart of man. The gospel message is a message that transforms us from the inside. Laws, rules, regulations, and things of that nature can have an impact, but they're not necessarily a moral impact to make us into better people and most certainly aren't the kind of impact that's going to transform us to become kingdom citizens. We should be concerned and we should be involved to whatever degree we're able to in, in the concerns of the age. I'm not saying that, that the church is supposed to hide from these things, but we need to understand that the only message that transforms a life is the gospel. And that's what Jesus came to preach, the message of the gospel. Amen. And the gospel speaks to the core. It speaks to the inner person. It speaks of our problems in life and gives us a solution. It tells us that sin has destroyed us, that sin has messed us, not just marred us, it has, it has destroyed us. It's ruined us. And we need to understand that there is a solution, and that solution is called the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. Because sin has destroyed us, we are to repent. We're to turn from it. Now, I'll point this out. and We're going to see this as we go through the Gospel of John. But, but Jesus was very direct. Sometimes we don't see him that way. But Jesus is very direct in his message and all. But even in our day, the directness and simplicity of the message is, is very often uh, not regarded. But the directness and simplicity of the message is really our model. You see, and I'm going to say this, and this can be controversial to some. But I'll, I'll say it this way. Hopefully it, it makes sense to you after being a Christian for 50 years and after pastoring this church next week for 40, 40 years. I think I can speak with some experience and authority as I say this. I, I'm not, as a pastor, called to constantly focus on the problems of our culture to make comments concerning it. I will. I, I, those of you who know me know that I do. And I'm not called to specifically only deal with political issues or promote political candidates. That's not my call as a pastor. You don't come to hear me. To, I would assume you don't come to hear me to tell you, hear me tell you who you should vote for and all of that. There are various ways you can discover those things for yourself. Watch the news, read the papers or whatever you do. Read your news feed, whatever way you get your information. Speak to your friends. Read your Bible. That really informs you what is good, what is not good, what is right, what is wrong. That should inform us. But you don't come here so that I can promote a political candidate. And I'm not, as a pastor, called to devise ways to attract an audience. I'm certainly not called to entertain bored people because God knows I'm not entertaining. And so I don't... In I don't intend to try and entertain those who are bored. Let me tell you something that you need to hear, and sometimes the church forgets this. What a pastor is intended to do is to proclaim a message that transforms people. That's what I'm called to do. It's called the gospel. It's a message that calls for repentance, and it's a message that provides the power to change. And that change is not simply external. That's a change that occurs internally and it's the internal that actually produces an external and it's not a message this gospel to be avoided it's not a message to be changed it's a message to be taught clearly in second corinthians chapter 2 verse 17 paul said it like this he said unlike so many we do not peddle the word of god for profit the word peddle there in the original language means to transform it we don't change it in order to make it more attractive. We don't peddle the word of God as some, he said, do. He said, on the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. That's what the minister is intended to do. And that's been forgotten, I think, by many in the church today. 
There are many in the church who come to, to a church service expecting something different than they receive. They're not expecting a Bible study. They're expecting to be given answers for their culture or a political candidate or something that tickles their ear. That's very true in, in many people's lives. I understand some of it. But the bottom line is, is the gospel transforms you. It ought to be something that, that we embrace because God can change us. And not only does he change us, but he gives to us an entrance into heaven itself through the gospel. I'm not going to go to heaven because I believe in a certain thing about my culture. I'm not going to go to heaven because I voted for the right presidential candidate. I go to heaven because Jesus Christ saved me. That comes through the gospel. We need to understand that. And we don't today. There are many who don't understand that. And we don't change it to make it something acceptable to people because the gospel makes the uh, people acceptable to God. And that's how it works. So it, it, it remains a message that is a call to change. It's not to be changed itself. You see, again, it's the gospel that, that changes lives, transforms lives. It's the one message that contains the power of God. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so the message is to be given clearly. It's to be given with pure motives. And any who gives such a message is to do so with integrity, with a premier desire of pleasing God. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, it says, For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our heart. Understand that, Christian. You have been entrusted with the gospel. Entrusted with the gospel. Some of us in this room were never trusted with anything. I mean, when I was learning to drive, my dad had, my dad let me drive his car. My dad, now I'm going to, it's okay. I'm, I'm, next month is my birthday. I'll turn 71. I'm, I'm not ashamed of my age. I'm glad I lived this long, you know, to be honest with you. <clears throat> but some of you, this is ancient history. So let me give you an ancient history. My dad, my dad, I don't know how much time I should take telling you this story. Uh, but I like to illustrate with stories. Forgive me if it bores you. My dad used to drive Chevys and Fords. That's great. They're great cars, obviously, obviously. But because my dad found himself working on our Ford station wagon, he had a 57 Ford station wagon with that phony wood. He thought it was a wood, woody, it was cheesy. But my dad, my dad worked on, on Saturdays. And so often just tuning up or fixing, working on the engine, my dad got tired of that. So in 1965, my dad decided he was going to buy a, a car that doesn't break down. Now, again, you've got to remember, this is 65. So there was a uh, car dealer just up the street from us that we could walk to. And it had, uh, you know, various used cars. My dad walked over there, and my dad was a saver, so he saved money until he could pay cash. And so my dad walked to this particular place, and I still remember him walking in. And, and as he walked in, the salesman walks up to my dad and looks at my dad and says to him, Sir, how can I help you? And my dad says to him, I'm here to buy a car. And he says, oh, he says, uh, and my dad said, I see this. It was an, actually, this the first one was a 60, a 60, cattle, uh, 60 Cadillac, a bronze. I still remember that. It was a big old boat. So this would have been 63 because I got another. Anyway, this is 63. So the guy says to my dad, uh, oh, Cadillac, huh? And he's looking at my dad. Dad was a truck driver. He was a plain man, you know. He says, you want to go and look at a Chevy? This is a, this is a Cadillac. And my dad had cash in his pocket. And he says, no, I don't want a Chevy. I've already had plenty of Chevys and Fords. And my dad bought his first Cadillac, a 1960 Cadillac, a big old boat of a car. Well, he liked it so much, he bought another one in 65. And the second one was the 1963 Cadillac. So my dad bought the 63 Cadillac. And guess what I learned to drive on? I learned to drive on a 60, 63 Cadillac. I took my driving test in a 63 Cadillac. It's like driving a yacht, you know, and it's a huge car. Make a wide turn in a small thing in the Cadillac, and you know what I'm talking about. 
And so now I've got my license. And so I say to my dad, Dad, can I go and talk to my friends? And, you know, I got my license now. And you can almost picture my dad as he pulls his keys out <laughs> to hand it to me. He trusted me with his Cadillac. And that's a big thing to trust a kid with, right? I'd, I'd say it is his most expensive car, a nice car to give your keys of the car to a kid. Guess what God trusted you with? God trusted you with the gospel. That's an awful lot more valuable than any car. He trusted you. Paul said it. Please let this hit your heart today. He said, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, the only message whereby a man or woman must believe in order to go to heaven. He trusted you with it, with you. And some of us in this room were never trusted with anything. We would hear the words, I don't trust you. And good reason, because I blew up my dad's car. But that's another story. <laughs> Life goes on. You've been entrusted with the gospel. It isn't a lightweight message. It isn't to be changed, altered, peddled so that people come back so I can boast about how many people come to hear me speak. It is a message that changes lives. It is a message that forgives sins. It's a message that settles in the heart. It is a message from heaven itself, and it calls for repentance. Jesus says, repent. To, to repent, metanoia, is a change of mind. To turn and change your direction through a change of mind. How do you enter into the kingdom? To the gospel. And so, for many, the gospel message was, even in that day, was radical and it was offensive. To our day, it remains so. And, 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 and even though it is offensive, God help us to never change it. God help us to not transform it. God help us to not gut it of its power. God help us to be faithful in the proclamation of it. You see, when John was out there preaching, he was preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was offensive. Then Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And for some, it was offensive, but for others, it was water in a dry place. It was the answer to their problem. I've been trying my hardest to be a good person. I can't. And Jesus says, you need to repent. You need to receive this message because in that message is forgiveness of sins. It's a transformed life. And that's what he's saying in verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Believe in the gospel. God is about to act in, in the work of redemption. The king has come. It's time for people to receive him. And his kingdom advances. And as his kingdom advances, keep this in mind if you take notes. You might want to remember this. His kingdom advances one soul at a time. One soul at a time. That may not sound like much, but that's a real important thing to think about. It really is. When our church began, we, would, we saw two new people show up every week for a while there, and and I told a friend of mine, I said, you know, I've noticed that, that the Lord is adding a little bit here and a little bit there. He said, oh, really? I said, yeah, probably a couple people a week are showing up that hadn't. That was a blessing. And he goes, oh, really? I said, yeah, that's not very much. I said, well, it doesn't sound like much. But when you have 52 weeks, that's over 100 people. When you have another, that's another 100. Now, the Lord is moving. But he always, listen, he always advances one soul at a time. He touched you. And your life touched somebody else. When he touched me, my life touched other people. And the kingdom of God is that way. That's why we're not to, to look at the day of small beginnings with any kind of uh, disregard. Because God begins in slow ways. And, and this is what we're seeing. You see, people must hear and receive salvation. And then what they do is they tell others. And that's what God has called all of us to do is tell others. And so that's what we're going to see here as we move into verse 16. It goes on to say, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, cast in net into the sea. They were fishermen. Jesus said to them, follow me. I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately 
left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. The calling of these disciples. God's call to service. Notice here in verse 16, Jesus was walking by the shore. He sees these two men. He sees Simon and his brother Andrew. Now, let me give you a little background to build, to build this up. Jesus already knew them. He had met them a few months earlier. Andrew originally had been a disciple of John the Baptist. And Andrew had been with John when, when John saw Jesus. It, it's recorded in John 1.29 when John called Jesus the Lamb of God. And so the next day, Andrew had left the Baptist and attached himself to Jesus. After spending the day with him, Andrew went and got his brother Peter. In John 1, 41 and 42, it says the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you're Simon, son of John. You'll be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The first thing he did is he went after following after John the Baptist, having Jesus pointed out by John the Baptist. That's the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. He spent the day with him. And then he goes first thing and he grabs his brother. First thing I did, first thing I hope that you did, when you got saved, first thing I told my family, first thing, I got saved December 27, 1970. I go into the den after getting saved, came home, went into the den. Mom, Dad, Madeline, Becky, I love you. Praise the Lord. I walk into the, another room and my sister Madeline and Becky follow me and they say, what's going on? I share with them what had happened to me. And my sister Madeline, first thing she did, she told me this years later, she said she went to bed that night and said, whatever you did for my brother, please do it for me. And that's how my sister got saved. And that's how my, my, my mom and my dad got saved. I shared the gospel with them because I had been taught, I had learned that the most selfish thing I could do is go to heaven alone. And I wanted to bring others with me. And so I told my family, the first thing you do is you tell your family. And that's what he did. We have found him who is Messiah. We found Jesus Christ. You tell your brother, you tell your sister. Some in this room are saying, no, you don't know my brother. I've told him before he wants to kill me. Well, you know what? There are plenty of ways to share with them. And one of them is a transformed life. And the other is waiting for the opportunity when the Lord gives to you to share with them the reason your life has been transformed. And sometimes you just love them so much you're willing to have them angry at you for telling them the truth. Because I told my dad that. I said, you're going to be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Christ. And that took a lot of boldness. I didn't realize that I just loved him. And sometimes love is simply speaking directly. And that's what I did. I love you. I don't want to go to heaven without you. Bow your head. You're going to come to faith in Christ right now. You're going to receive Jesus right now. See? And so you just have a heart. Please, may the church wake up to this. We've forgotten it in many ways. How important it is to tell your family about Jesus Christ, about what he can do. And that's what he did. And he brought his brother to Christ. It says, we found the Messiah. We found Christ. He brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you're Simon, son of John. You're going to be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter, is the rock. Well, Andrew and Peter were businessmen. and They had a partnership with James and John. It would seem as you read about them and you go through the Bible, you'll see this, that they were successful. They, they obviously were well known by others. You wouldn't know this at first glance, but when you read that Peter owned a home in Capernaum, that tells you that he, he made a good amount of money. And, and when you know that John was actually known by the high priest of Israel, that tells you that he had a, a lot of pull also. So these are people who are apparently well known by others, successful, but they're called now into permanent discipleship. They're now being called to follow him full time. Jesus is giving them an invitation. Notice what it says in verse 17. He said to them, follow me. I will make you become fishers of men. He's calling them to service. Now, 
In the, the time of Christ, the rabbis would instruct people to follow their rules, to follow their traditions. I've done a whole study on, on the mentoring process during that day. They would teach them, they would teach you how they prayed. They, they would teach them the manner that they moved their body when they prayed. They, they would teach them all these ins and outs. They would mentor them and all. And Jesus is saying, now, I'm going to, to train you in, a diff, in, in the same and yet in a different way. You see, because the rabbis instructed people to follow rules and traditions, but Jesus isn't calling them to follow rules and traditions. He's not saying, you need to follow my religious rituals. He's saying, I want you to abandon your personal dreams, and I want you to abandon your careers, and I want you to learn from me. That emphasizes that Jesus expected his men to love and follow him above everything else. As his modern day followers, we're not being immediately commanded, if you will, to abandon careers. What we are commanded to do is to place him above any other master or anything we've pursued. And in this calling, we see that Jesus intended his work to not just be a first century work in Israel, but to continue into the future. You see, the church was designed by God to continue past the first century. And in selecting these fishermen, he's creating a continuing work. Because these men are going to be his building blocks for the work of the church on earth. In Ephesians 2, 19 and 20, uh, Paul said, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people, members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. They were intended to impact the generation. But that impact was supposed to continue into the future. The church has been created to reveal how wonderful and loving the God of the universe is. And the church has been created to shine as lights in a sin-darkened world. And even though the devil attempts to destroy the work of God, the devil cannot succeed. Sometimes we think that he is. He's, he's, he's wreaking havoc. There's no doubt about it. He knows, his, he knows that, uh, that his greatest enemies are believers. He knows that. There's no doubt about that. He knows that. And sometimes we can get discouraged and we can say, oh, he's going to win. He's going to win. That's just not true. That's not true at all. Jesus said it very clearly in Matthew 16, 18. He said, I tell you that you are Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. We are overcomers in Christ. And just because the world is shouting and trying to drown our voices out, and it is, we shine as lights in a very dark place. And people are still hungry for the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we need to understand is, is when Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. We need to know that the word church, in, in reference to a new creation, a new community, is actually the Greek word ecclesia. And the word ecclesia speaks as a community, uh, called out ones is what it literally means. They would use the word ecclesia when it spoke of a synagogue or an assembly of people. It would speak of a congregation. But Jesus is building an assembly of called out ones that are going to be his witnesses. And as those called out of the world, we influence the world to come to Christ. In 1 Peter 2, 9, the apostle said, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what you are. We need to identify with what he calls us. And called us, God has called us to live a life that is different different from those who don't know him. We're called by God to influence the world for Jesus until he returns. And we're to do that by the life we live and the message we give. In Titus 2, 11 through 14, it says, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That's you, zealous for good works, called out of darkness into his light, not giving in to the temptations of the world to live as the world, but to live differently. 
And that's what we're called to do. And that's what he was calling these men to. And he says to them. Follow me. Now it says again in verse 16, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. I want you to notice something. If you take notes, you might want to note this, and perhaps this may be speaking to somebody listening right now. God's calling and timing may interrupt your life. These men had an occupation, and it would seem apparent that they were successful. But Jesus had different plans for them. I've discovered, and some of you have too, that God has a way of interrupting our plans in order to bring us into his. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. I've got plans for you. You may have plans for yourself. I was an assisting pastor in another congregation. I told my wife, it's obvious that I'm not called to minister here in this church. I had been ordained as a pastor in 1979. I served on staff. It was now 1981. And I came home on a Monday night because we used to have meetings, the pastor and the board and I, every Monday night. And I started coming home telling Marie, it's time for us to move on. It's time for me to move on. Marie didn't want to. Marie thought because the pastor was attacking me every, every Monday, I was getting personally attacked every Monday. Marie thought I was running from, from a, a problem, and I wasn't. I just knew this is not for me. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to move on. And uh, I know this will surprise you, but I, this happened for a little while, and I finally came home, and I teared up in front of her. I said, it's killing me. This is killing me. I can't do this anymore. The pastor is mocking me. He would mock me. He mocked me openly in front of the church. And I said, because I have a passion, and he didn't. And other things. I said, I've got to, I've got to quit. I've got to move on. And finally, I did. You'll hear a little bit of the story next week if you come for the evening. Dan and my friend Randy, who were my first two assistants here, will be sharing with me. So I said to Marie, I said, you know, I've always loved San Luis Obispo. Maybe it's God's way of taking us to San Luis Obispo. She said, you know, he's not. You know, he's not. I said, well, why not? I don't have a job. I have a friend of mine who is running. He is actually a manager over a, a bread delivery service. I said, listen, I can get a job with him. I can still be delivering bread. Maybe not the bread of life, but I'm still a, a bread deliverer. She said, no, you know that God has not called you there. But some, sometimes God's call to serve him does not coincide with what you wanted to do. You know, that's the truth. If you just said, out of all the places in the world to go and minister, where would you like to end up? <laughs> Chino, no. Ontario, no. No, San Luis Obispo, or a place like that. During the time when we started here, there were still a lot of flies in Chino. Some of you have been around for a long time, you know what I mean. All the dairies and everything, you couldn't have a barbecue outside without having special guests. The flies. Yeah, the mascot of Chino was a fly for years. I mean, there were just flies everywhere. So, no, it's not, you know, Hawaiians do not wake up on a Saturday morning and say, man, i got to get to Chino. They just don't do that. It's not the place you want to go. But, you know, sometimes the Lord's plans interrupt your own. Keep that in mind. Sometimes the Lord's plans interrupt your own. I was going to go to... Bible college, get my degree. It took five years at that time. Then I was going to go two years for a master's. Then I was considering the possibility of doing a three-year THD program. I had already eight years plus planned out. This is what I'm going to do. And the Lord interrupted my plans and placed me here. 
He has a way of putting you where you're supposed to be in his giant chessboard. He says, this is where you're supposed to be, right here. These men had an occupation. They already were successful, obviously well-known, at least John was, homeowner, Peter was, and yet he called them out of their comfort zone and he said, I'm going to use you in a way you didn't even know. You see, God delights in using ordinary people that he may accomplish extraordinary things. That's because when he does that, no one can take the credit from him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 and 27, Paul said, brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. It's been said that God delights in building on the foundation of human impossibilities. And that's what he was doing. And so in verse 17, it very simply says, follow me, I will make you become fishers of men. Come after me. When it says follow me or come after me, come after it speaks of an immediate reaction with no delay. Come after me, follow me, I'll make you become fishers of men. And they understood immediately, instead of using their nets, they're going to catch men. The net they would use is a message that Jesus was to give to them. And notice in verse 18, they immediately left their nets and followed him. There wasn't a hesitation. There wasn't an argument. They were ready to do so. Charles Spurgeon once said, when Christ calls us by his grace, we ought not only to remember what we are, but we ought to think of what he can make us into. He takes you and he transforms you. They didn't see themselves as the foundation of a new creation called the church, but God did. And he not only called them, but he equipped them to serve him. So we're to follow him because he's developing us and transforming us. And he's the one who fashions us into fishers of men. Isaiah 64, 8 says, Now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are potter. We all are the work of your hand. And so he's calling them, I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately, verse 18, they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets, and immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. This was not a word to only one or two people. It was... In reality, we're seeing this. It's a word to four. The work that was to be done needed many to be involved in it. Now, he had said, you're going to become fishers of men. That obviously gave insight into the commission to preach the gospel. Let's see. I don't want to get before... I have some things I wanted to say, but I'm adding this right now as I'm thinking. Let me say this briefly, and then I'll go back to my notes. One of the worst things that the church has seen over its history, not recent history, but in the history of the church is this. It's what used to be called, and this is a word that older people will understand and younger people wouldn't have a clue what I'm saying. Um, but we used to have a show called The Lone Ranger. He was all by himself. He's the Lone Ranger. And he had a, an Indian friend that he called Tonto. I used to think his name was Tonto, but that's a different, that's a different, a different word. Tonto means dumb. But his name was Tonto. The Lone Ranger. We're not called to be the Lone Ranger. The worst thing that we can be is isolated. That's why when they put people in prison and they're either protecting them or because of problems, they put them in solitary. The worst thing that human being experiences is aloneness. And I'm not giving a message on aloneness. I'm just illustrating it. We, are, we have not been created to be alone. It is not good that a man should be alone is the first bad thing God ever said. 
relating to men. It's not good that a man should be alone. In ministry, in life, we need community. We need relationship. When the Holy Spirit fell and created the church, birthed the church, there were 120 waiting. And from there they spilled out and ministered, and the church began to grow. It was a community. Look at Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. You see the earmarks of the church because they remained steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and prayer, and etc. It was something that they had community in. It's something to understand. So I want to say this quickly because it's not my notes, but it's something I feel inspired to say at the moment. You were not created to be by yourself. You weren't. And when America was isolated for as long as it's been, it's not been good for America. It's not good to be in your home, locked in all the time, by yourself. It's a bad thing. And people go nuts, and they, they get stir, we used to call it stir crazy. They get crazy, cabin fever, what do you want to call it? You need relationship. And it is not the same when you're watching online. It's not the same. You're receiving the teaching but you're not receiving the community. And that's not good. You know, yeah, people are stinky sometimes, huh? Sometimes they say, greet your brother. Oh, please don't. I mean, Lazarus, come forth. You smell like your, your breath is a grave. There's dead things in it. It's, 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 it's difficult to be with people. But I want you to think about this. It's, again, I'm just saying this briefly as if that's possible, but I'm trying. I really am. If you'd have told me when I first got saved that over the years, the amount of people that I would come into contact with and some would become my dearest friends, I wouldn't have believed you. Why? Because by nature, I'm very shy. People don't know that. Some of you may think, if you see me, you may think that I'm kind of rude. I, I can appear that way because I'm shy, because I've always been introverted. I don't have, I don't have skills that helps me to be friends with lots of people. Forgive me, I'm just being real. I don't. I want them, but I don't. That's why God gave me Marie. She does. That's true. And I can sit and I can listen and I can visit and I can talk. I can do that, but I'm uncomfortable. Over the years, the Lord has been gracious to bring into my life people who have helped me to come out of that. I used to sit by myself as a little boy because my mom worked. I was always by myself. I did not know how to have friends. I did. I'm not. I'm trying to explain something to you to show you something. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm not asking for sympathy or understanding. I'm just trying to say that's who I am. When I got saved. I was brought into a family, a community of people who had like goals that I could learn from. And they became, many of them became extremely dear to me, extremely, like brothers, sisters. That's called the church. You, yes, you, 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 you haven't been called to be alone. And when God began his work, he didn't just say, you know, Peter, we're going to build around you alone. There was a community of, of men like-minded, filled by the Spirit, God used to develop this new thing called the church. And so he didn't call these four men to, to just be four. He called these men to be a team. I was talking to a, a, a very dear friend of mine just this last uh, week, a couple days ago, Don McClure, and Don was talking to me about this, and we were visiting, and he was saying, you know, that he said, I never realized that God would give me brothers that I love as deeply as I do. That's what the genius, genius of ministries, because how could you get a political zealot and a tax gatherer and put them in the same group and actually accomplish things. Because if you knew anything about the tax collectors and the zealots of the days of Christ, then you would know that that would be like getting someone from the Ku Klux Klan and uh, 
and, uh, and Antifa and bringing them together. And they actually united and worked together and loved each other. How's that work? How did that work for this guy who hated tax gatherers and the tax gatherer who could not stand the political zealots? How did that work? He gave him something greater. He gave him love. By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you love one another. That's what he gave them. Their love was in Christ. And it gave them the ability to, to, to grow out of the things that separated them. And it gave them the things that they could unite in. Do you see that? And he's got these four men. Now, these four men already have community. They're business partners the four men that are mentioned here, they actually already work together. They're business partners. But what he does is he brings them and makes them a unit. They're unified. And, and what they're going to do is they're going to go together to make, he's making them fishers of men, and they're going to go and reach people. So I want to show you one more thing as we're about to close here that you might miss in verse 19. When it says, when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, who also were in the boat. Notice the word mending, mending their nets. I want to share something with you. You go out and you preach the gospel. You do it united. The gospel of the kingdom transforms life, uh, lives and, and makes it possible for people to come into the kingdom of God. That comes through the gospel. It brings salvation. And the preacher proclaims it. But the gospel also does something. Why do we share the gospel of Jesus with people? And it says in verse 19, he saw James and John mending. That word mending is a Greek word that is repairing, preparing, and restoring. That's what the word mending. They were mending their nets, repairing their nets, restoring their nets, and preparing it for work. They were repairing their nets. They were fixing tears. They were preparing the nets for service. The word mending is the same word found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, when it speaks of equipping the saints for works of service. In Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people. That word equip means to mend or to repair for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. The apostles were fishermen who were experts at mending nets. They are now going to fish for people and bring healing to their broken lives. And the way that they're going to do this is by caring for people and restoring them. They're going to do this through the teaching of God's word, which repairs them. It says in Psalm 147.3, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Every one of us needs to believe and understand that it is God's word that brings healing. Sympathy and compassion and empathy are helpers in bringing healing, but it's God's word that brings healing to the broken. You see, Scripture is so powerful, it can transform you from the inside out. In Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. When it says it's perfect, it lacks nothing, restoring the soul. The law of the Lord, the word of God, the word restoring speaks of refreshing or reviving the soul, the essence of the inner person. And it's, it's saying here that any broken life can be transformed by the word of God. When Jesus ministered to the lost, he first preached the gospel. For within it is the power of God to save and transform. In Luke 4.18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free those who are oppressed. And that's why Christians, especially pastor teachers, are mending people by the teaching of God's word. And it is a wrong thing for the pastor to stop teaching the word to just attract a crowd. What we're here to do is mend broken lives. And that comes through the gospel. We have to understand that today because many have forgotten that. Many have forgotten that. Church is not a place of entertainment. It is a place of healing. And when the word of God is rightly divided and applied by faith, our lives are changed. John sitting right here, I'll embarrass him for a moment. Why not? John can tell you his testimony. I see him and it comes to mind, John. I knew John when he was six years old. 
I've known, I taught a Bible study at his parents' house. His mother made Marie and my wedding cake. But John, I hadn't seen him in years. John went into drugs and the things that pertain to that. Put in jail. He had all kinds of bad things that went on in his life I wasn't familiar with. All I know is he came here was in Lion Tamers that you got right with God. He came here to church. I didn't even know John was here. And he came to church here under Lion Tamers ministry. He got his life right with Christ. And now he sits here as a dear one to me, a son in the faith. And what happened? It's the word of God that transforms lives. That's what it is. You need to understand that some don't. Some don't. Oh, we have an empty church. We need to give something that will bring them in. Let's have smoke and lights. Let's do something. Smoke and lights did not heal people's broken hearts. It doesn't. Uh, a, a pastor who can juggle and preach at the same time may be entertaining, but isn't doing much good. A pastor who goes out with his sheep afterwards and drinks a little beer or wine with them to show them that he's just one of the guys is no good. You're not looking for a buddy. You're looking for a pastor. You're looking for somebody who can help your broken life. And that's what we do. We preach the gospel. That's how it works. And that's what they're to do. Preach the gospel, but repair. You have... You have been repairing nets that are torn from service. But you repair them so that you make them ready for service. How can you be made ready for service? By the word of God. And that's part of the ministry that is forgotten very often. That is part of the ministry that is neglected. And leave everything behind, guys. Follow me. And they did. There was a missionary we all are familiar with if you've been a believer for a long time. You, you may know this, Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott lost his life in service to the Lord as a missionary. And he said this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. Preach the gospel. Live the gospel. You have been saved to serve. Father, we ask that you would work in our lives. What a precious, precious thing it is to realize that when we finally do. And I lift up this congregation, Father. And I pray that we, the church, would actually never forget what our call is. For those who are watching online, I pray that you would speak to their hearts and awaken them. Perhaps what they've heard may be disturbing. Many have already turned off their computers. They don't want to hear this. But others have remained and listened. And I pray that you'd be with them. I pray for this church. That we would not fall prey to any technique that is intended to simply gather people to have filled chairs, but empty people. I, I would pray that we would remain faithful to what you commissioned your men to do. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, and live repaired lives. Even as our eyes are closed, perhaps there are some right now who need to get right with the Lord. The Spirit of God is telling you that. You're broken and you need to get right with him. You need to get right. Whether you're not a saved person or whether you're a saved person who's just not living for Christ, whatever the case may be, I want to pray for you. And if you need to get right with the Lord right now, would you raise your hands? Let me pray for you right where you're at. Father, you see these hands. You know the reason why they're being raised to you. In Jesus' name, I ask that you would reach down, touch everyone whose hand is up and move in them, Lord. Wash and cleanse. Forgive and fill them with your spirit. Lord, I just ask that you would do that because it brings glory to you. And for those watching online, I pray that you would speak to those who may be opening up right now to you and you would fill them with your presence, Lord. Various countries are watching. I ask that you would just touch people in various countries. So, Lord, we just come to you in faith now and say, God, be merciful to me. Forgive me. Fill me with your your Holy Spirit, I want to live for you. I'm sorry I've sinned against you. Forgive me and use me. 
Lord, I pray that you would do that because our, our hearts are open to you now. And I thank you for this and bless you. You can put your hands down. Jesus, I pray you continue to move in all of us. In your name, amen.